All right, good morning, everybody. Sorry I seem so uh, scattered. Uh, Lori's teaching uh, uh, the women of wisdom this morning, and uh, there were 100 sausage biscuits to bring in. <laughs> so uh, there's always a little bit of this and that. All right, so I thought you might enjoy uh, this uh, uh, for our, our beginning here this morning. Uh, I'm very thankful I have the privilege uh, to be your teacher, and uh, we have several things I'd like for us to do, but before we uh, do that, um, let us uh, bow our heads and our hearts in prayer. Our Father, we say with the psalmist, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. So this morning, Lord, we quiet our hearts uh, in your presence asking that uh, you would come by your Holy Spirit, uh, show Christ to us, teach us from your word, give us joy, give us clarity. We're thankful, our Father, for our other Sunday school classes, the boys and girls, young adults that are learning, our other equipped class. Uh, Pray for Brother Ron as he teaches. Help me as I teach. Just come to us today, our Father. Be, Be close to us, we pray, through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, this morning, as I, I start the class, I want to do a, a couple of things uh, for your encouragement. Uh, the first of all is to just do a little bit of what I'm going to call... Oh, you still can't hear me? How about now? Can you can you hear me? Can you hear? Is that better? Is that better? Not, not better? Better to some? How about you, Brad? Is that better? Okay. I'd like to recommend a couple of um, books for you this morning, uh, which I think will be of edification. Uh, One of them is just a general book that I'm going to recommend to you that uh, doesn't directly deal with the class, but I think would be a great blessing. Uh, We've been dealing with the book Practical Religion uh, by J.C. Ryle in the college and career class, and we came upon the chapter The Family of God And one of the parts of that uh, chapter has to do with the love of God uh, and the love of God for us as believers and our adoption that we have in Jesus Christ. And I think this book was published, well, yeah, it's been a while. Some of you might remember it, 1989, 1989, so it's been a long time ago. But I'm going to um, just say a word about it. Uh, if you are needing uh, to be built up in your love for God, but most of all, his love for you, this is just a really good book. Uh, and I use this in preparation for that chapter uh, by J.C. Rowell. And I'd like to just give you the highlights, okay, of the, of the book, okay? The first chapter is that we are children of God. Every day we need to wake up reminding ourselves of our identity that we have in Jesus Christ, that I'm adopted. I'm an adopted son and da- son or daughter of Jesus Christ. The uh, book goes on to talk about the new birth that we have, that we have been born uh, by the Holy Spirit. Uh, it talks about that we are adopted children, that we have certain family traits as the people of God, that there's a certain family life that we have as the people of God, as children of God, uh, that we have been given the Holy Spirit, the spirit of adoption uh, dwells within our hearts by which we cry what? Ah, the Father. That's right. We have a family freedom. There are certain liberties that we have now as the children of God. Those are hard to work out, aren't they, sometimes, so that we're not stepping on our brethren. But at the same time, we do have certain freedoms and in Jesus Christ. And then there's a good chapter on the Father's discipline, too. That our Heavenly Father loves us, and He disciplines us so that we can be stronger, so that we can be uh, better servants for His name. Now, class, what would the last chapter of this book be? Anybody have a guess? Raise your hand. We all have a final destiny as the children of God as well. We all have a final destiny. And that is that we will all be together in heaven. Every one of us. Weak, strong, uh, 
Presbyterian, yeah, Baptist. Uh, Ryle does a nice job there as well. Okay, so our family destiny. So I'd like to recommend that book to you. The next thing that I want to do is a couple of other books. The first one is a survey of the New Testament. Survey of the New Testament. And that is by um, Dr. J. Gratian Machen. Uh, it's a very helpful and good summary. Of course, it's he, he wrote this many, many years ago, but I've gone back to this book again and again. This book was actually um, one of the textbooks, you guys, for uh, some of the um, Christian schools uh, years and years and years ago, probably when a lot of us were, well, were boys and girls. But um, this is a very helpful book. And what he does is he summarizes chapters. He goes through who the author is, who the, when the date, some of the specifics. So I think it would be a great resource to have in your uh, own personal library. The last book that I'd like to recommend is called uh, Illustrated Bible Survey, and that's by uh, Dr. Ed Heidenson and by Elmer Towns. Uh, and they've done a very good job. I've used this book now for a couple of years as a resource um, as well, just again to give a good overview um, some of you may know that Dr. Towns was Ar- isn't. I think Dr. Towns is still alive. I think still alive, but was Arminian. But the book does not come across as Arminian in its uh, presentation of the different books of the Bible. But it's very helpful. Gives some good color pictures of things. The archaeology, which is very helpful when we get to see things live, uh, live like that. Dr. Ed Heinsen does a very nice job as well. Uh, they also have some resources at the back of different other books if you were wanting like some introduction of a particular book of the Bible. And some of our reform writers are in there as well, including Dr. Mur- John Murray. So uh, I think they, our, our dear friends have been faithful. Um, but I w- would find it to be a good book um, if you are homeschooling or working with uh, boys and girls or young adults. I think you would find this to be very helpful. So, for example, I will randomly open it up to the book of Ezra and Nehemiah. So some of his resources include um, Derek Kidner. We would know Derek Kidner. Uh, Some really nice, helpful questions. Uh, A really uh, good um, summary of the author, date, recipients, key word, and key verses of of the particular book of the Bible. You could also go online, you guys, and Crossway has some very helpful materials. The SV Study Bible has some very helpful materials. But I just would really recommend going back to those resources. Um, maybe some of you have been reading, some of you have been reading the Word of God for a long time, but it may be good to go back and just remind yourself of certain key points or certain key thoughts that are in uh, those places of Scripture. Okay, so. Now, as we begin here this morning for our our lesson, I just want to give a word of thanksgiving to Nathan Allen for all the hard work that he's done for this class. He's taken the principal load of the class, and I really appreciate him doing that. Next week, God willing, we will have um, Scott Weber, and he will be teaching on the book of Revelation, and our class uh, will come to a close. So, uh, it has been fast, but I hope it's been good. It's been an opportunity for you to get an overview of these particular books of the New Testament. Uh, It's quite a a challenge to go through each book quickly, but it's good for us so that we can see the whole of Scripture. Um, And so, without further ado, let's tighten down our sails here this morning, and let's get ourselves uh, going into what the Lord has for us. So this morning, what I want us to do is to take up the books of Hebrews, James, First and Second Peter, and the book of Jude. <clears throat> so as I just said in the last, we'll tighten down our sails and we'll ask the Lord to help us as we um, move along in these good books uh, of the Bible. Uh, whenever I'm teaching uh, uh, class, different classes that I teach, I usually spend the first few minutes of class trying to find my clicker, but I found it quickly this morning. Okay, so here we go. First of all, as we think about these books of the Bible, okay, in its most basic overview, 40,000 view, each are very precious to the believer and are designed for certain issues in the life of the church and the believer, 
Okay, so as we come to these books of the Bible, maybe not as much. You maybe you don't read them quite as much. Maybe the Book of Hebrews you do, but but they're for us as God's people. They should be read again and again, and even memorized. There are a number of places in uh, these these books of the Bible that can be memorized. And I would just say, I didn't put this in the slide, but I would just say that we might think of them as spiritual medicine for us. Uh, we might also think of them, and, and I, I, I hesitated for a while if I was going to say this, but they might be like the vegetables in a meal. Um, we're not like, you know, we think the Apostle Paul or we think of the Gospel of John, but they're, they're very important truths that God has for us that help us and make us healthy as believers and you'll, I think you'll be able to see that in just a moment. So what I want to do for some of you who are new in the Lord, who, who maybe don't know a lot about the Bible, and that's okay. It's a journey of learning and growing and having fellowship with God, isn't it? And, and, and He teaches us just again and again in His precious Word. And, and we can say, those of us that have walked with the Lord longer than you have, we come to a book of the Bible and we say to ourselves, did I even read it last time? Did I even think about it last time? And so I want to give you, give you an overview uh, as well. Can you see that? Okay, I know it's a little bit small. The first thing I want you to know is that as we study the book of First Peter, we're talking about hope and tribulation, hope and suffering, that there is hope uh, in our Lord Jesus Christ as we face the different uh, difficulties and trials uh, of our lives. Secondly, Second Peter is going to remind us about God's precious word and how important his word is to us. It's also going to tell us about false teachers that are going to come into the church. And one of the things that these books of the Bible are going to do, First Peter, but especially Second Peter, uh, maybe parts of, of Hebrews, and in the book of Jude, that false teachers can come into the church. And so we're warned against false teachers. We're also reminded that our Lord is coming again. And so does First Peter as well. The book of James is going to tell us that true faith produces good works. True faith is going to produce good works. As we, if, if we've really been transformed by the Holy Spirit, who is God himself, then we're going to produce good works. There's going to be um, a lifestyle that's going to happen in our lives that others will see. Now, some of you are excited for this next slide. The book of Hebrews. Christ is superior. Christ is superior to angels. Christ is superior to the law. Christ is just superior and what a glorious uh, book the book of Hebrews is to, to look at and to learn from again and again. And then finally, the book of Jude, warnings against false teachers. Warnings against false teachers. Jude, Jude is like, there are, there are a number of things I'd like to teach you about, I'd like to tell you about. But he focuses in on these false teachers with the idea that we would contend for the faith. Uh, that has been once for all revealed to us. Okay, so there's our books of the Bible. There's, they'll give you a bit of an overview of what these are. Don't worry if you didn't write them down this time. For those of you that are writing down, you will be seeing them again. Trust me. Okay, so this morning, bigger picture still. I want you to understand where we are in the, those of you quilt people, this is for you, in the fabric of the scripture. Like if, you know, they say you take the quilt, you turn on the back and you see all the stitching and all the different pieces. Well, this is kind of what my chart up here does. And I think I showed it to you the last time I was with you. But here are all the different parts of scripture. And I wish I had a better vocabulary, you all, to really get across to you how wonderful it is. The, the, the varied style and books of the Bible that God has given to us, right? It's not just didactic prose. If it was, that'd be wonderful. We would bow down on our knees and we'd say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God who has revealed his truth. His word is purified, what, seven times as refined in a fire. But what God has done in his word is he's given us all kinds of genres, all kinds of books of the Bible and all kinds of situations. And so... For a few of you, maybe you've not known this, but there's the law, there's history, there's poetry, there's major prophets, and that's because they're what? Anybody remember? They're longer, that's right. And then they're minor prophets, they're shorter. All of these have so many prophecies, right, about our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that we can 
go into. And you can, if you take those books, you can read around in them and you can find those prophecies. You can go to the New Testament and you can see them being fulfilled, right? Um, Then we come to the New Testament. We have the Gospels that share about the life of our Lord Jesus Christ. Remember Matthew, Mark, and John look at uh, the mountain from one side, right? And then John, he looks at the mountain from the other side. Uh, That's just really uh, important. There's the same mountain, but John records a number of different accounts. We have the book of Acts about the history of the church, and then you have all these epistles right here from Paul. And then right now we're going to be in the general epistles, and we've already covered uh, First and Second and Third John, and now this morning we're going to cover some other parts of the general epistles. Okay, so we're in the general epistles of um, the New Testament. Okay, and again, just a wonderful uh, variety uh, that the Lord gives to us—a variety of authors uh, and a variety of, of time periods. But all one scripture, right? All scripture is what? All scripture is given by what? Inspiration, right? By God, breathed out by God. Holy men of God were what? Carried along by the Holy Spirit. And so that's what we have before us. And so we have the privilege this morning of of looking at these scriptures. Okay, so we come to the book of Hebrews. Here's our chart again. Now, I'm probably jumping down into the weeds, but here I go. As we come to the book of Hebrews this morning, um, I'd like to encourage you uh, by, by saying that Hebrews is such a wonderful book of Scripture, and I can't do a whole lot with it because it's just a short class, as we know. But I'd like to recommend this book. Um, I wish someone would explain Hebrews by Stuart Olliott. Uh, I've been using this in a discipleship uh, book with one of the brothers, and we have found the book very, very edifying and helpful. Uh, The book has short chapters. So does Children of the Living God, you all, by the way. Three, four pages for for us where we can focus, we can think about. Uh, Elliot does a very nice job of paraphrasing some of the Scripture passages so that we can understand them. Just a wonderful uh, and helpful book. understanding uh, for us of the book of Hebrews. Uh, Pastor Bob Prentice was the one who recommended this book. In fact, right before he died, it was his idea that we would teach this, cla- this in the college and career class. So we got started. I think we got to chapter 2. And then um, I think that was, I think it was right before COVID uh, began to really you know, come along and everything like that. So uh, it's, it's, it's recommended on good uh, by, by our wonderful uh, dear brother now with the Lord. Um, I have this link for any of you who want to see it later. It just gives us a little bit about the history of Stuart Elliott and his ministry. I believe, uh, is that right, Bert, that maybe Bill Hughes was in this, his church for a time? They knew each other. Gotcha. They, 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 they were at different churches, but were brothers. He is still alive. Okay, okay. I, I kind of thought he might be, but I wasn't sure. It's written some other books. I, I, I know I'm not getting very far, but uh, Three and One. Anybody read Three and One about the doctrine of the Trinity? Oh, wow, you'll get that. Pastor Stu uses that as this foundational, one of his foundational books about the doctrine of the Trinity, written many, many years ago. And it is clear, um, it, is, it is simple in the right sense of the word for those of us whose uh, brains uh, can't, you know, that tr- once you get into the, the Trinity, you know, you've got to stay right on target or you, you could go in, of course, to, to error. But that's a very, uh, very fine book. Uh, I would recommend as well. Okay, so what's my point? Well, I want to to just give you this thought from the book to help you. Every Christian, Stuart Elliott says, Pastor Stuart Elliott says, needs to understand Hebrews. If they do not, they will misunderstand the Old Testament and will also fail to fully appreciate what our Lord Jesus, what our what our, what our Lord Jesus Christ has done, what He is doing now, and what. He is going to do in the future. And as a result, they will remain spiritually stunted. Okay, very powerful uh, word by um, Stuart Elliott. I have an extra copy I can give away to someone, maybe the first person 
who comes to me after class, and you can have that book and you can use it. And I think it will really uh, be a benefit for you as you study uh, the book of Hebrews uh, and learn more and more and grow in it in your understanding. Okay, a couple of quick um, things about the book this morning. The author is unknown, although many people believe that the Apostle Paul might have written it. Some think that Luke could have written the book, maybe Barnabas. The recipients are not stated in the book of Hebrews, but it's most likely Jews who had passed through a severe persecution for their faith. Let's look over, let's turn just now into the scriptures in Hebrews chapter 10. And let's um, get ourselves going here. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 32 through 34. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 32 through 34. But recall the former days when, after you were enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings, sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction, and sometimes being partners with those so treated. For you had compassion on those in prison, and you were joyfully and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property, since you knew that your that that you knew that you had a better possession, an abiding one. Okay, so a little bit about the recipients. The date probably around seventy A.D. And of course, as we said earlier, Christ is what superior, right? Christ is better, or Christ is superior. Uh, key verse for the book of Hebrews. We could go a number of different places, I'm sure. But Hebrews 4, verse 14. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. Okay, so that is a key verse, key thought here in this book of Scripture. Here's a really helpful outline. I know I've talked to you last time about about these outlines that are from Insight for Living. Living. Precept Austin also has very good uh, outlines as well. But again, for some of you who may be new in the Lord or just understanding things of the Lord, or uh, maybe you've not studied the book of Hebrews very much, let's get the biggest, let's get big picture. Jesus Christ is superior in his person. Jesus Christ is superior as our priest. And Jesus Christ is superior for life. Okay, and you can trace that about how in the book of Hebrews it talks about Jesus being better. So as you go to this book of the scripture, you're going to be seeing how Christ is better uh, than these things. And it will really, really help you as you understand the Old Testament, especially as you understand um, uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus and Deuteronomy. Dad, would you mind reading for us Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, and we'll just say a minute about these profound truths about the Lord Jesus himself. God, who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory, and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high, being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Okay, and so if, if, if you haven't <clears throat> known this, now you do know this, why the book of Hebrews is so rich, <clears throat> it's so full, it's so wonderful, it's so deep that uh, you, you start reading the book of Hebrews and you get to verse 4 where Dad finished and you're like, i got to meditate on this, i got to think about this, I can get my journal out and try to write a few things. And then you're just overwhelmed and, and you're only at verse 4 and maybe... It's Thursday of the week and you started on Monday and you're still kind of, but that's okay because you're praying in, you're believing uh, the scriptures, you're getting uh, to know the Lord in a deeper way. So these are just uh, profound, profound words and I'll just put up the 
the little boxes here front for you. But each of these demands so much time and so much thought and so much meditation and so much prayer. But we can certainly uh, bless the Lord and we can use these in our prayers, dear ones. Right. Sometimes you may come to prayer and you may say, I just I'm just really struggling in prayer. Well, we can come and we can say, oh, Lord Jesus, you're the radiance of the glory of God. And that's a good thing to pray. Right. And and help me to understand what it means. Oh, Holy Spirit, who is within me, come and teach me and help me. Okay, excuse me. Um, The book of uh, Hebrews helps us understand the doctrine of angels as well. Um, And and these are just some notes that Pastor Bob uh, gave to us in the class on angels. Um, And I won't go through them except just to show that the book of Hebrews really does help us in our doctrine of angels. And if I can make a step out practically, I know in my own work is working out in the secular world, it's interesting, not interesting, but that's the best word I can use right now, how people are so enamored with angels, but not with Jesus. And so they'll start talking, oh, you know, there's a book about angels and stuff. And bless you. And so what you end up needing to do is get them oriented to what the scripture says about angels, right? And and then to point them to our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, now I'm going to give you a little bit of work to do. And so, turn over to Hebrews chapter 11, okay? Like we said, this is a Bible, what? Survey. So, we're doing the survey here. Now, we're going to run all the way over to chapter 11. So, we know chapter 1 talks about the greatness of Jesus Christ as the Son of God. We know that it talks about that Jesus is superior than angels. And then we looked at the outline. And so, now, in Hebrews chapter 11, we have what? Well, we have the great hall of fame or the, of faith of those who um, were, were so influential uh, in uh, the Hall of Faith. And I, I can't remember if this is the Baseball Hall of Fame or what. I, I can't remember. Uh, anyway, okay. Now, now, I know some of us read more slowly than others, but this is a scanning exercise. That is where you're trying to look at the bigger picture. So I'd like you to try and start with verse 4 and go all the way to verse 17 and count... For me, how many heroes of the faith do you do you find? Okay, so ready, go. Okay, stop. How many did you get? Got eight? Bird? Eight? How about in the back? Yes? You got ten? Okay. All right. Say what? Okay. I don't really know the number right now. (laughs) I have to be honest with you. It kind of depends on, you know, do you count like... Uh, if you, but the point that I'm trying to get as is we only got for you guys, I only took you to 17, right? Okay, we still got to get all the way, if we had time, to verse 38. Okay, and what, what did I do? Well, I just helped, helped you see just the span of those that were those of faith in the Old Testament. Okay, so this is a great summary. You with me? Great summary of the Old Testament right here in Hebrews. There's also one in Acts chapter 7. There's also one in um, Acts chapter 14, I think, or Paul's sermon. Okay, So these, this is a survey of that's what is being done here. And so we have those that were strong in faith. Okay, Wonderful place to go back to. Okay, I've got to conclude with Hebrews here. So here are my applications for you. Okay, Listen, listen carefully. Go again and again to this book of Scripture. Go again to this precious, precious book of Scripture. And then a couple of other points. Let Hebrews warm your heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. 
If, you're, if you're, you feel your heart is getting cold, go to the book of Hebrews. Go to chapter 7. Go to chapter 8. Go to chapter 9. Go to chapter 10, for example. You can even jump right in and read those verses slowly. Have a pen. Have a paper. Um, remember we said last time, maybe set your timer for four minutes, right? And then nothing can really get in that four minutes. And then you and the Lord have fellowship for those times and, and have your heart warm to the Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe for some of you this morning, these words, the book of Hebrews needs to admonish you. And maybe there's some here who need that. They need to be admonished to be true and faithful. The Hebrew believers were becoming weary. Their knees were, as the apostles said, they're kind of hanging down. They were becoming weary in the way of the Lord. And so they weren't as faithful as they were when they were standing with those who were in prison. And that's a condition, right, that some of us can have at points. We just, we begin to falter in the way. And so we need God's word. Well, the book of Hebrews will help to strengthen you and to fortify you and to admonish you to keep in the way. So that we may not be those that turn back. Hebrews has some serious warnings for those that turn back, that turn back from the way. We don't want to drift off the way. Okay, lastly, uh, read it. Read it as you read the Old Testament, particularly um, Leviticus. It's a good place to put together. What's a good principle of Scripture? Of, of interpretation. When scripture tells you what scripture means, that's what it means. That's Stephen Bird paraphrase there, okay? But uh, the theologians say it better than that, right? If the New Testament, if, if the book of Hebrews says something like, and it does, the Holy Spirit says in some place, then you know what? That's what the Holy Spirit said. And so we can, we can say, this is what this means, okay? There are a lot of places where we're like, what does this mean? And we have to say, well, but when the Scripture interprets the Scripture. And that's true with the Old Testament, too. There are places in the Old Testament where a, a, a writer further along will say, this is what a prophet or all was meant. Let me just challenge you with these words uh, Dear ones, as they were a challenge to me, and I wanted to put these words of Scripture before you and encouragement. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 25. Therefore, brothers, that is, therefore, brethren, that's the idea of the word, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God. And I would write on that verse the basis of the work of Christ, of our relationship to Christ, to what Christ has done to us. Okay, it's, We are not in a works religion group or family. It is because of what Christ has done. This is the basis, right? The blood of Christ, what he did on the cross, right? We have a nod here, right? That's right. It's him. Okay, therefore, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith. Okay? with our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. So let us draw near, the, 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 I almost said the Apostle Paul, but the, the writer says, Second, let us hold fast the confession of our hope. Every one of you believers this morning have a confession of hope. You have hope. Hold on to that hope, the Apostle, I mean the writer says again. Hold it. Hold it tightly, Right? Of course, I've already done the basis, right? But he says to hold on to that hope and do it without wavering, okay? For he who promised is faithful, right? Even as we're holding, he's holding on to us. God is so faithful to us. And I know as we look around in this room, you can stand up and you could say, yes. I just want to say that to this moment, God is being faithful to me. I've not been as faithful as I, if I, I even could. I can't even begin to think about my faithfulness. I don't even want to think about that, right? But he has been faithful to me. Furthermore, third thing the apostle tells us, or the writer tells us, let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good deeds. There are more good deeds. There are more works. There are more activities that Christ has for us. We, we must not be a church that's looking to the past and saying, oh, well, there was the revival in 1740 with George Whitfield, right? And, and, well, there's the 1859 prayer revival and the revivals in Northern Ireland. And, well, there's the Cambashang revival in 1905 in Wales. No, let us stir one another up to love and good works. 
right? And the Lord is giving us good works, isn't he? He's giving us our Sunday school program that goes on right now with the boys and girls. He's giving us the ESL ministry. Uh, he's giving us Haw Fields, okay? So I'll uh, just say maybe, maybe a couple of you men, you need to think about just going once this year and, and, and teaching the Word of God and sharing uh, the Word of God uh, at Haw Fields. Uh, maybe you could go with another brother, you could share your testimony. It wouldn't have to be a long testimony, but you maybe could share your testimony uh, there at the Hawfields. Fields. Maybe you could play the piano or, or some, you, know, you do a musical instrument just once, right? See, see, one of the things that God's been teaching me lately is this. Sometimes just small acts of faith, he really, he really is so pleased with where, where we just say, you know, Lord, I'm just going to do 1% more. Does that make sense? I'm going to try just this, just a little bit more. I'm just going to push myself just a little bit further. I'm just going to go out for you. And, and, and when we obey God in faith, there is such, such joy. Okay, I got to keep moving. But I, I, I just put that before you uh, as your pastor and one who loves you so much. All right, book of James. Okay, so we come to the book of James. However, there's our reminder chart, and let's come to the book of James. Turn over to the book of James, if you will, and let me just read verses 1 through 4. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes in the dispersion, greeting. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. All right, a little bit about the book of James. More than likely, the book of James was written by the Lord's half-brother. It's probably the first epistle that was what was written in the New Testament. One of the facts that I was excited to, share, excited to share with you is that there are 108 verses and at least 59 commands. So it's like you moms. I want to tell you this, and you need to remember that, and put the trash over here, and pick up your room, and you need to dust those top shelves because there's lots of dust, okay? Uh, 108 verses, 59 commands. It's a bit like reading the book of Proverbs. Sometimes I'll read Proverbs and James together just because of the similarities. Short, pithy sayings, one right after the other. And the central theme, and I I don't have time to get at it like I would like to, the central theme is faith produces works. Now, if some of you would like a more deep dive into the book of James, Thomas Manton has a commentary on the book of James, for example, that you could read uh, if you wanted to read one of the Puritans. That would be very helpful. Another thing that you can do is you can type um, good commentaries on the Bible, Ligonier Ministries, okay? And what it will do is it will give you a web page, and you can click on any of the books of the Bible, and it will give some of the top helpful commentaries on those books of the Bible. Uh, maybe more technical, if you're looking for more technical or more, um, uh, I don't know what the word is, devotional. That's the word I want if you would need devotional. But it would be very helpful. Okay, and then here's just a, another quick outline for the book. When stretched, it doesn't break. When pressed, it doesn't fail. When expressed, it doesn't explode. And when distressed, it doesn't panic. Okay, and then a lot of other uh, important truths as well. I have to say to you, I did some more study on the book of James and really was thankful to the Lord. I listened through the whole book of James. And let me just say here at this point in the lesson, I would just encourage you to, to take times throughout the day and even throughout the week to listen, or to, listen to the Bible. If you can't read the Bible um, uh, or, or reading becomes more difficult or your vision isn't as well, um, you can get those little earbuds Right, and you can vacuum and 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 listen to the Bible. Okay, so I vacuumed the downstairs yesterday evening for you know because today's Sunday and there'll be company. And I got all the way to Hebrews six. Okay, that might surprise you, but it's true. Um, Or maybe some of you go on a walk, or maybe some of you are already doing that. You're listening to the Bible 
read aloud. I would just encourage you to keep doing that. If you don't have that app on your phone, that's one you might get on your phone and just listen to it read aloud. If, read aloud. if you're still in the CD player, use the CD player. If you have an older car, which I do, <laughs> I have a CD player. Um, or if you need a little CD box, but listen to the Bible. Okay, let the Word of God wash over you. The nice thing about that, you guys, is what you're doing is you're seeing the whole of that book. And then as you have your quiet time when you're there with the Lord in the morning, then maybe as you're reading the text, you can make more specific notes and you can get down deep. But I would just encourage you uh, with that. To have the Word of Christ. Let it, let it just be in you richly. And then... For some of us old school people, you can even write it on a little piece of paper and put it in your pocket or have it in your wallet that you can carry it around. Um, uh, I had uh, a dear sister, older sister. She doesn't go to this church. But what she does is she takes uh, important passages of Scripture and she glues them to little um, three-by-five cards. And then she has this little yarn kind of... I'm not good with like string and craft names, you guys, but and that she puts with it. It's like a little worm, and it's got two little eyes, and she puts that in the little card, and she sends it to people to encourage them uh, with God's word. So I'll leave it at that. Okay, the book of First Peter this morning, the book of First Peter. Now, I'm putting this picture up for you because I wanted to show kind of a picture that stood out in my mind and it kept standing out in my mind and so I had to put it up. This, as we think about the book of 1 Peter, we have the idea of living for Christ in a hostile world. And we are in a hostile world. We're in a world that is, is coming at us in different ways. But we can live for Christ in this hostile, hostile world. And the book of 1 Peter gives us uh, encouragement about that. The, the book is going to talk a lot about the sufferings that God, God's people face. Sufferings that we to this point have never had to face, but some of our brethren in other places have. And the only reason why I have this picture up here is that this is just a terrible um, storm that, that hit Port Stewart in Northern Ireland. And I remember seeing this on a BBC report and thinking... Wow, look at you know how the waves are just, they've come over that playground and they're coming up into those buildings and those buildings and those places don't have power. I don't know if there were injuries or, or other types of de- devastation. And yet, what was interesting was that um, almost six months later, I visited that place in Port Stewart, Northern Ireland, and there's the playground right there. And you can see how all that water uh, has been pushed back. And, um, and it's just a reminder that God can push back uh, difficulty and hostility by his almighty power. Um, here's our outline again. We keep going through. And now let's go to the book of First Peter. Okay. First Peter is one of my top favorite books of the uh, New Testament. Uh, I, I, I just love those early verses, which we'll read here in just a minute. Uh, The author is Peter, okay? I'm going to tell you just a little bit about the audience, which I think you'll find very encouraging. Holy and hopeful living in a hostile world. If you're struggling with that, if maybe you're becoming a bit sour uh, spiritually, the book of 1 Peter might be a place to go to revive your hope uh, and and heart in the Lord. Uh, The date is hard to pinpoint, and he has a helper who is helping him with the book, and that is Silas. Pastor Jones has done a lot of work on the book of, on who Peter is, so I'll just give you a few things about Peter. He was a mentor to John Mark. That's incredibly encouraging, isn't it? And he could take rebuke, right? That's incredibly encouraging as well. The Apostle Paul had to rebuke him, but he received that uh, rebuke from our brother. Okay. Just a quick outline about the book, and then I'll read some scriptures. Salutation, our great salvation, our example, our Lord, and a conclusion. Let's listen, or you can turn over to 1 Peter chapter 1, and I'll read verses 1 through 5. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, 
to those who were elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father and the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Christ Jesus, Jesus Christ for sprinkling with his blood. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. And then it just goes on from there to encourage and to strengthen and to support our hearts. Now, I don't know if you remember, but turn over with me now to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 16. I, I really love this, by the way. This is really exciting. Acts 16, verse 6. This is the Apostle Paul uh, and, his, and the missionary team. Okay, I know I'm, I'm moving around everywhere, hanging with me. Missionary team. And they went through the region, verse 6, of Phrygia and Galatia, having been for what? Bidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And when they came to Mysia, they attempted to go into Bithynia. Or as the old King James says, I think it says they essayed to go into Bithynia. But the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So passing on, they went to Mysia. Okay? Now, back to 1 Peter. Did you hear it? Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia. What happened? Did you see? The gospel did go there. It just went there at a later time. Isn't that amazing? You need a map, don't you? Here's your map. Galatia, Cappadocia, Pontus. And remember, there's also regional Galatia and um, geographic Galatia and provincial Galatia. But anyway, okay, so the gospel does go up here. It's really exciting. That's who Peter is writing to, okay? So the gospel goes to these people, okay? Here it is, way up here in Pontius. Okay, this letter. Who took the letter? I know. He, he texted it to him. No way. Somebody took the letter. Somebody took the scroll. A faithful brother or sister carried the scroll, just like probably Phoebe may have carried a scroll. We don't know. Okay, and it's up at the Black Sea, which is a very interesting thing to, to explore, which I won't get into Here's some of the region. It's not like it's really populous. There <laughs> there are populous places, but uh, it's very mountainous. Here's some of the coinage there. Here's just a place you could visit there if you wanted to. Maybe you could stay at this place and look out. But the point is the gospel did go there. And so Peter is writing this letter to them. Okay? And he's, and he's telling them <clears throat> our living hope and ho- about our living hope and our holy living about our submission and God's honor, about our suffering and Christ's suffering. Okay? Now, let's talk about Silas. I hope this will be an encouragement to you. This is a bit of a diversion, but nevertheless. And I want you to think this this morning about this question. What does God have for you to do? What does God have me to do? What is your moment where you may have a particular role in serving the kingdom of God. Well, Silas had a few of those. I don't know if you know much about Silas, but here we go. His Latin name is Silvanus. We see that in the New Testament. According to Acts 15, which Jones is about to get to, Pastor Jones is about to get to, he's a prominent member in the Jerusalem Council. Okay? He accompanied Paul on the second missionary journey. That's what... We were just talking about. He was imprisoned at Philippi. And I put up there, he was singing too. We're always talking about Paul singing, Paul was singing. But Silas was singing too, right? Now, he may have been Paul's helper, which he was. He's a faithful helper, but he was singing too. He was there too. He was being persecuted too. Okay? He's, he remains at Berea with Timothy They were more noble than those in Thessalonica, for they searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so, Acts 17, 11. Peter speaks of him as a faithful brother, and he was an amanuensis for Peter. 
And if we had a little more time, I'd ask, was it amanuensis? But that's just the personal secretary. It's just the personal scribe for Peter. So as Peter would say things about the scripture that needed to be written on that scroll, right? And you should take a minute sometime and look up what a scroll looks like, those papyrus scrolls. There's some nice websites on that. And you can see how, how fragile those scrolls must have been. But he wrote on those scrolls um, uh, for Peter. He was his amanuensis. And then that's the last we hear of him. Okay? So it's just something to think about. What's your moment? What's the place that God has for you? Where for a, maybe for a season or for a period, he has a special work for you to do. Well, Silas took it up, and God blessed that in his life. And God blessed that for us. What a help that was to Peter. We don't know why, it was, uh, why, why Peter decided to use him, but he did. We know that the Greek of Second Peter... There's not nearly the type of Greek, apparently, that the book of 1 Peter is. And that's probably because Sylvanus was more educated. So he was helping. Okay. Um, take time when you can in your own uh, devotion time to go to these, these verses in 1 Peter 5, 6 through 11. These are the verses that tell us to resist the devil, um, to be humble before the Lord, to cast our cares upon the Lord. Just very, very precious and helpful uh, scriptures. Uh, when you're reading the book of First Peter and Second Peter, you, you get an idea of how Peter struggles like we struggle. Uh, Peter says, resist, resist the devil. And we go, yeah, because we know Peter, uh, Jesus said, Satan has desired to sift you like wheat, but I will pray for you. And so as he's telling us, resist the devil, we're like, yeah, you, you had trouble too. I, I'm going to try, Peter. I see how you're entering in uh, and, and know what it's like as a struggling, even falling believer. Peter tells us to resist the devil firm in faith using God's word, and Peter reminds us of the victory. Okay, the book of Second Peter. Again, we've got Peter as our author. Audience, again, are the churches in Asia Minor. The theme, God's grace in opposition. Here's our date. Key verse, Second. Peter 3, verse 18. Let's go over to that. Probably some of you have memorized 2 Peter 3, verse 18. If you haven't, I would strongly encourage you to memorize that scripture, to have it in your heart, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. We're always growing, dear ones. We're always learning more about the Word of God. We need to be growing in Him. Feeding our understanding of him, learning more here at this Sunday school time, here at the morning service, here at the evening service, here at the prayer service, always growing and learning in our Bible study times, our devotions times, feeding our hearts so that we might grow in the Lord. Um, Again, here's just another outline that you might find helpful and then there are a number of key themes in the book of Second Peter. Um, God's grace results in godliness. The revelation of truth in Jesus and the scripture is sure because it is, is from God and not from man. If you need your heart warmed about the inspiration of scripture... False teachers are handed over for destruction. This book, the book of Jude, the first Timothy chapter 4, deal with this idea that there are false teachers, what false teachers are like. And I think in our day and age, we need to pay more closely, more more close attention to these scriptures than maybe we have in the past. False teachers are ethically bankrupt. Believers must endure. And that brings us now. To the book of Jude. Book of Jude. Okay, so turn over to the book of Jude. So here we are. We're we're sitting on the last, next to the last book of the New Testament. Listen to these words. Jude chapter 1. It's only one chapter in Jude. Verses 1 through 4. Okay, this will give you the heart of the book. Ready? Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called, beloved in God the Father, 
and kept for Jesus Christ. May mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of God of our God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. And then Jude's going to go right in and he's going to expose them. He's going to explain what they are like. Okay, so it's written by Jude, our, uh, the half-brother of our Lord. Uh, it's written for those who are called, beloved, and kept for Christ. Those are words you, can, you should meditate on just to think very deeply about your, your, your calling in Jesus, that we're beloved in God the Father, that we're kept either for or we're kept in Jesus Christ as believers this morning. Every one of us who are true believers, we're kept for Jesus Christ, these believers are to contend for the faith. They are to hold the truths that they have received. And that there has and that there will be opposition to the truth. And then, after Jude, in these next verses from 5 on, uh, expose the false teachers. Then what he does is he gives some powerful exhortations to the believers. Look at verse 17. But you must remember, beloved, the predictions of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. They said to you that in the last time there will be scoffers following their own ungodly passions. It is these who cause divisions, worldly people devoid of the Spirit. Okay, and so then that ends. You with me? That ends this this discussion about these false teachers. And then what the apostle, or what Jude does is then he's challenging these believers to be faithful, to be true. And he gives them these reminders that you see up here on your screen. I'm going to read them to you. Uh, Words worth memorizing, words worth meditating over. But you, beloved, see, notice how his, his love for them. Build yourself up in the most holy faith. That is, be studying, be, be, be understanding the scriptures, be giving yourself to the word of God. Keep learning. And pray in the Holy Spirit. Pray under the guidance and under the help and under the influence that the Holy Spirit uh, will have upon you. Keep yourself in the love of God. And then wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads uh, to eternal life. Be waiting for the Lord. At Bradford, sometimes, Bradford, when I'm teaching Bible, I have... A, a, a question I'll ask the kids. And so I'm asking you, and you don't have to raise your hand, but I want you to just play along, and I'm just about done. I'll say, okay, let's all stand in the circle. And it's just a word game. I said, And I'll say this. How many of you have thought about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ this morning? Now, sometimes it's three. <laughs> And I'm, not, and I'm not one of them sometimes, many times. Sometimes it's zero. Brethren, we, we have to be thinking about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what Jude is saying, right? Waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. Are you waiting for it? Maybe, maybe that's where some of our sourness and some of our despondency and some of our anxiety is coming from. I'm not saying that's all you know that. But... But are we waiting? Are we looking? Well, I've got 12 seconds. I remember my dad saying one time that of all the pastors that he ever knew who preached the word of God, there was one pastor who had a constant theme that Christ is coming again and that we're to be excited about it and we're to be hopeful for it. And his name is John Boyd, right? Pastor Boyd, okay? Because that was in his, it was just, it was always coming out. Christ is coming again. Christ is coming again. We must be thrilled about that. Next thing uh, Jude does is he talks about how we need to be merciful and how we need to work for those who doubt. Verse 22, and have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. To others show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by flesh. There are different spiritual needs of different people. Be thinking, be sober. And if we're doing these things, God will help us to have that righteous response to those people. 
You say, is there, is there any more, Stephen, here in the book of Jude? Well, we're right at 1030, so I'll give it to you. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling. You, me, he is able to keep us from stumbling because he said so. Right? It's true. I'm not going to like bang on my Bible really hard, bust it up or something. But it's true because God said it. And to present you blameless before the presence of his glory. You and me presented blameless because of him, because of his persevering grace, because of the work of Christ on the cross, because of the Holy Spirit. And how with great joy. Can you imagine the joy we're all going to have when we're all together there? Just, just with Jesus and, and all those that have gone on before. So Jude says, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time. And then what? Now and forever. Amen. Okay? Hope and tribulation. Reminders. Your faith produces works. Christ is superior. Warnings against false teachers. And a glorious benediction. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. Our Father, we're thankful for these books of Hebrews and James, First and Second Peter and Jude, for the good word of God that they are, for some of us how they have ministered to us and blessed us and challenged our hearts and exhorted our hearts and admonished and warned our hearts and kept our hearts. We pray, our Father, that as your people, we may be those that are waiting uh, for the mercy to be revealed at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Be with us now, we pray, through Christ our Lord. Amen.